As it was stated earlier, I come from Weimar Institute, and our vision there is pretty simple, to heal a hurting world. And uh, that is physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, and spiritually. And what I've noticed, for those that come to Weimar Institute to get healing, how long they stay healed for is intimately connected with the key ingredients as to whether they have endorsed these ingredients in their life to living the psychological good life. I mentioned this to the faculty yesterday. Ellen White's prediction that we shall see the medical missionary work broadening and deepening at every point of its progress because of the inflowing of hundreds and thousands of streams until the whole earth is covered as the waters cover the sea. Ellen White made it clear that Christ is not coming while his people bypass his healing ministry. He wanted every church member to be involved in healing a hurting world. Mm -hmm. This isn't just this is not just to be Weimar Institute's vision. <laughs> it really should be every church's vision mm -hmm. is to heal the hurting world around them. And we have had a tendency in our church to think that this is the optional optional part of our message. You know, we really don't, um, you know, we really don't want to incorporate health as part of us. You know, that's an optional thing. Um, we're just going to do, you know, uh, the things that are seen as not optional, but health, is op health and healing often is seen as optional. Well, I quoted in the faculty research the number one quoted researcher in the world today. His name is Baumeister, and his research is on self-control. What is self-control? It's the ability to keep ourselves from acting on our behavioral emotional impulses. And according to a recent review by Baumeister and colleagues, self-control failure is central to nearly all the personal and social problems that currently plague citizens of the modern developed world. That is a major problem in our society today. Lack of self-control is actually the number one cause of heart disease. Why do I say that? Because if we know how to prevent heart disease, and we're not incorporating into our life, and we die of heart disease, what's been the problem? Was it our heart? No, it was our mind. Lack of self-control. And we actually now know it. It's very well known throughout the world how to prevent and even reverse this disease through nutrition and lifestyle measures. It shouldn't be in the top leading cause of death in Korea. It should not be in the top leading cause of death in the world. The major problem is not the heart, though. The major problem is the mind, lack of self-control. Diabetes, it's become an epidemic in the world. When I was in medical school, 80% of diabetics were type 2 diabetics. Now it's 95%. Type 2 diabetes, it's very clear. Yes, genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. Mm. And we know how to prevent type 2 diabetes. You might have genes from both parents, and you should never have to develop type 2 diabetes if you put into practice the diet and lifestyle that will totally prevent it. Why has diabetes become an epidemic? It's because of the lack of self-control that's become an epidemic. Mm -hmm. Sexually transmitted diseases, I just saw a report the other day. You think these are going up or going down? Uh -huh. I thought we knew how to prevent these. Condoms were gonna be the solution. But despite all of these, quotes measures that are going to prevent these, sexually transmitted diseases are at an all-time high, and they're going up even in America today. Stroke. Major problem in our society, but stroke can be largely prevented through self-control measures, controlling the blood pressure, 
controlling the habits that lead to it. Alcoholism, by definition, alcoholism and addictions have become such a problem in Korea that the government, as you know, gave a significant amount of money to help establish the addiction section here and at Sam Buick University to try to be able to help people get over these addictions. But I can tell you, they're not going to get over them completely and fully in their life unless they understand what I'm going to be presenting here today. Murder, far too common, often due to lack of self-control. Rape, you think that's going up or going down in the world? It's going up significantly. Rape of children is at an all-time high. Lack of self-control. Depression, once we know the principles of mentally healthful living and we begin to suffer from depression, it's lack of self-control. Harvard University recently stated that 80% of cancers are preventable if we would put into practice what we know on how to prevent this disease. It's a major killer. It's actually now the number one killer in America in those under the age of 85. Largely a preventable disease. Unwanted pregnancy, by definition, lack of self-control, adultery and divorce. Often, if we get to the core of it, what started it was lack of self-control on the part of one or both partners. Unemployment. It's not always due to lack of self-control, but it certainly can be. I know as an employer, I've had some great employees when they show up to work. <laughs> but I couldn't depend on if they were going to be there or when they were going to be there. And since they were so great, I gave them lots of opportunities to correct their behavior. And then they would come to me after I'd have maybe the fourth or fifth conversation and say, Dr. Nedley, I'm sorry. I think you just need to let me go. What would it be? They'd be partying the night before, not being able to prevent themselves from acting on their emotional and behavioral impulses. Financial failure, lack of self-control very often, relationship problems often due to lack of self-control, and then these many addictions, one of the most rapidly rising addictions, technology addictions. Mm -hmm. What's one of the clear signs of a technology addiction? You're in a very engaging, interesting environment, and you're texting someone far less interesting, mm -hmm. who might be in the same room across the way. <laughs> And studies show it leads to problems very similar to alcoholism in your life. That's just a partial list we could go on. But you know, this lack of self-control problem, even though it's at an all-time high in our society today, it's not new. Paul wrote about it. For I know that in me that is in my flesh nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I what? No. Do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. I'm going to ask you, individually, to search your own heart. Do you know of something that would be good for you to do that you're not doing in your life? Mm -hmm. Or do you know of something that would be better for you not to do that you find that you're imbibing in and you are participating in even though it's unhealthy and you know you shouldn't do it? Mm -hmm. Paul mentioned that he had that issue. Now if I do not, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And then he ends this discourse by saying this, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Some people have mistakenly stated 
that the life that Paul talked about in Romans 7 is just going to be the everyday experience of the ordinary Christian. God does not want us to be wretched people. In fact, the song Amazing Grace uses that term. You remember how it uses it? Mm -hmm. That saved a what? Wretch. A wretch like me. Yes, left to ourselves, we'll all be wretched. But God's plan is to bring us out of this wretched. Amen. Amen. And that's why Paul didn't end Romans with verse 24. By the way, there's one other place in Scripture the word wretched is mentioned. It's in the last church, the Laodicea. And these are the words of Christ now. Because you say, I'm rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are what? Wretched, Wretched miserable, poor, blind, and what else? Amen. Naked. Why are you naked? What is it that you don't have? The righteousness of Christ. So this is even a salvational issue. But you know, a lot of people think they're saved, but he's saying, you're wretched. You think you've got it all together. You might have a good job. You might even be the head of your department. You might even be the valedictorian of your class. You think you've got it all together, but you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So what is the secret to avoiding this wretchedness? First, I'm going to tell you what the secular research says. And then I'm going to tell you the fail-safe way of avoiding this wretchedness. The secular research tells us the solution to this problem is what? Temperance. That's an old word. But it's being resurrected by the psychological community. There's two secular psychologists who've written a lot about this and, of course, a lot of others. Um, they wrote a book called Character, Strengths, and Virtues. One of the greatest virtues they mentioned there is having the strengths of temperance, which is actually a Weimar, comes from the Weimar acronym, New Start. You know, a lot of people don't know. You know I asked before if anyone had not heard of New Start. New Start actually started at Weimar. It's a trademark <laughs> name from Weimar. Uh, but it's not that Weimar originated it. Um, we, we might have put together um, those letters into an acronym. But what is temperance? The world tells us it's moderation in things that are healthy and abstinence of things that are unhealthy. It also tells us that strict temperance requires what type of self-control? Comprehensive, Comprehensive self-control. Now, Every one of us has selective self-control. Even the marijuana user will have selective self-control in certain areas. I haven't met anyone that doesn't have any self-control. Some people will say I don't have any self-control, but they actually do have self-control in certain areas. And even great people will have meticulous self-control in certain areas. Arnold Schwarzenegger built up these big muscles. Does it require self-control to do that? Yeah. Meticulous self-control. But in an area of his life where it was more important for him to have self-control, when his maid was cleaning the house, mm -hmm. he lacked it. And he lost the love of his life due to not having comprehensive self-control. It's very clear that's why he lost the love of his life. He did not want to lose her. But he didn't have comprehensive self-control. Now back to the secular researchers in our endeavor to measure this class of strengths. We have found that among people in the mainstream developed world, which we consider Korea part of, strengths of temperance are infrequently endorsed and seldom praised. Regardless, the strengths of temperance are very important and they have a rich array of positive consequences for the what? Psychological good life. 
So to live the psychological good life, you have to be a temperate person, is what the world is telling us. Now, how do they know it's so connected to the psychological good life? The reason why is the world has been studying this the last 15 years. That's why Baumeister is the most quoted researcher. And in order to study self-control, in order to study anything, you first must be able to measure it. And so they've come up with tools to measure it. I'm going to give you a little example of a self-control test. It's actually the most comprehensive self-control test that's been developed. But I'm only going to give you a few questions from this test so you can get an idea of what they're measuring. And I'm going to ask you, if you are rated very much, if you were to, were to answer this a five, each one of these answers a five, would you be considered to have low self-control or high self-control? So you can say it with me, low or high. I have a hard time breaking bad habits. That would be what? Low self-control. I do certain things that are bad for me if they are fun. Low self-control. I have trouble saying no. Low self-control. I am good at resisting temptation. High self-control. Getting up in the morning is hard for me. Low self-control. I blurt out whatever is on my mind. Low self-control. I spend too much money. Low self-control. I keep everything neat. High self-control. I get carried away by my feelings. Low self-control. I do many things on the spur of the moment. Low self-control. I don't keep secrets very well. Low self-control. I often interrupt people. Low self-control. I am always on time. High self-control. I'm not easily discouraged. High self-control. I eat healthy foods. High self-control. Pleasure and fun sometimes keep me from getting work done. That's low. I have trouble concentrating. Low. Sometimes I can't stop myself from doing something even if I know it is wrong. Low self-control. I'm able to work effectively towards long-term goals. High self-control. Well, you get an idea of what they're measuring here. And when they have measured this out among groups of people, and then studied other traits, this is what they've been amazed at. People that score high on this test have better personality adjustment, higher self-worth, they're better at controlling their anger, they have fewer symptoms of somatization, obsessive compulsive patterns, depression, anxiety, hostile anger, phobic anxiety, paranoid ideation, and psychotic tendencies. People with high self-control are more conscientious, they're more emotionally stable. They make better, what? Relationship partners. They get along better with other people. They're actually more accommodating of others, not less accommodating. They report more satisfying relationships and they have better adjustment in their relationships. In addition, people with high self-control have better family cohesiveness, less interpersonal conflict, better perspective, and better empathy. They don't wallow in their own personal reactions to other people's problems. They have more secure interpersonal attachments. They manage money well. They spend less and they save more. Well, I have four sons, and they're all unmarried. But I've told them, before you start a serious relationship, you better offer your girlfriend a self-control test. <laughs> Uh, and actually, they better take one themselves, too, to make sure they're, they're worthy of it. But this has so much to do with your future success and happiness. This would be a great screening tool before you tied the knot. Now, it turns out children can also develop self-control. Children with better self-control are actually more popular with other children. And this was an interesting study. They looked at 32 character traits of children at age six. And they found out that only one very accurately predicted their SAT score at age 16. That's a big academic 
test that's taken later in high school to determine whether you're going to get into these Ivy League schools, these high colleges that are hard to get into. And they found out self-control at age six was connected to how well they did on SAT scores at age 16. Displaying self-control by the age of 11 is highly correlated with successful employment throughout participants' lives. Participants with low self-control experience three times as many months of being unemployed over 22 years when compared to those with high self-control. And notice, this is recent research. This was just published in Psychological Science, April 2015. So the world is very interested in this. They've recognized this is what's missing. Now here's what the secular research also tells us. In the course of daily life, in spite of their best efforts at self-control, People inevitably do what? Sin and what else? These, are, these terms were written by secular researchers. This wasn't religious people. <laughs> in the course of daily life, in spite of their best efforts at self-control, people inevitably sin and transgress, at least on what? Rare occasion. Can we agree with this in general? I think we can. Here's what they state. People with high self-control, when they do this, score relatively low in shame and high in shame-free guilt. What does that mean? Individuals with high self-control are inclined to take responsibility for their transgressions rather than externalizing blame or minimizing the importance of the transgression. In short, having done wrong, high self-control people are inclined to focus on the effects of their behavior and in so doing, are inclined to do what? Make amends. In contrast, low self-control individuals are more apt to experience painful feelings of what? Shame, an emotion that often provokes two things. Defensiveness and denial, rather than what? Repair and redemption. So what does this mean? This means if you're a high self-control person, you're actually going to become a better person over time. If you're a low self-control person, time's going to go on, but you're not going to become any better. In fact, you'll probably become worse over time. So you can, can you see why this is so intimately connected to the psychological good life? Well, the researchers, being good researchers, not only looked at the positive benefits of self-control, but they also ask the question, if you're way up here on the scale of extremely high self-control, are there problems that are going to develop? And it's a good question. Uh, you know, we can have, remember, temperance is moderation in the things that are healthy. Water is something we know is healthy, but did you know you can get too much water? And it can cause some health problems. So what about self-control? Here's their statement. There's no scientific studies anywhere demonstrating any undesirable consequences of high self-control. In fact, it's been tested for curvilinearity to see if excessive self-control or over-control might produce negative consequences, but no negative patterns were found. Although in our society there may exist a stereotype of an over-controlled person, one who is overly restrained, cautious, and uptight, and not spontaneous, we see no evidence that self-control is to be blamed. So in other words, if you have problems in this area, it's not due to too much self-control, it's due to other problems. By the way, this book is, uh, the abbreviation is Character, Strengths, and Virtues, written by Dr. Seligman, University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Peterson, University of Michigan. Now, the secular research is progressing, but I can tell you it's been limited at this point, because here's what they also state. Relatively little is known about how self-control is acquired and strengthened. So they tell us wonderful things. This is the psychological good life. This is what's important in you becoming a better person over time. But then they state, we don't know a whole lot about how to take someone who has low self-control and turn them into a person with high self-control. 
In fact, they go on to say, this topic must be regarded as a high priority for further research, especially in view of the many benefits that self-control confers. So they're imploring people to do research, see what we can do to turn someone from low self-control into high self-control. Now they do state this. Most acts of self-control involve overcoming some incipient response to the immediate situation in order to pursue some greater long-term benefit. Hence the ability to transcend the what? Immediate situation is what? Crucial. By the way, I'm giving you a little forerunner for those that might be coming to our Emotional Intelligence Summit in February. I told our researchers yesterday we have a Zen Buddhist coming to tell us, he's a former Zen Buddhist, he's a neuroscientist, but to tell us about these Eastern meditation techniques and, and he's going to be talking about meditation, the good, bad, and the ugly. Here's part of the ugly. Meditation teaches you to live in the present moment. And here's what the research shows. People who live only in the present moment are unlikely to exhibit good self-control. Whereas future-mindedness will do what? Facilitate self-regulation. By the way, there is a term in scripture that's used repeatedly. One word term that means future-mindedness in the positive sense. What is that word, anyone? Looking towards the future. It's called hope. <laughs> and, and writing, writing the, the term, term Seventh-day Seventh Adventist, Adventist is a term that means the blessed hope. And so out of all people that should have the most self-control, who should it be? If we're really living by our name, we should be up there. Now, Baumeister has gotten some of his publicity due to his research in bright lines. This is now a quote from Baumeister. People need bright lines. They really help with self-control. What is a bright line? He defines it this way. Zero tolerance is a bright line. Total abstinence with no exceptions. How? Anytime. Now, one of the reasons why he discovered this is he saw some statements that had these zero tolerance things that were at least implied and built into. Some of those zero tolerance statements actually come from the law of God. The Ten Commandments. Thou shalt what? Not. By the way, speaking of the thou shalt not, some people have think, well, the Lord got it wrong. You know, he's telling thou shalt not. Uh, as far as the best business models are concerned, do you know what we're finding out? The best business models that bring corporate success is when the president of an institution is given thou shalt not by the board. And everything else they're actually allowed to do. It's actually freeing to have thou shalt nots because these are lines that you're not going to cross. But everything else you actually can do. And uh, ac actually, Weimar Institute has developed that. Uh, it's called the policy governance model. And it's one of the reasons why I think Weimar is going forward in, in successive ways where you don't have too much micromanagement and manipulation by the board. But there are definitely thou shalt nots. Well, back to Baumeister. What he did is he actually had a group of atheists and agnostics quote the Ten Commandments before they took a very complex test. And they didn't know why they were taking this complex test, but they wanted to do well on it. It was really assumed it was important to do well. And it, they also had the opportunities, there were opportunities implanted, they would have to go for those opportunities, but opportunities to cheat on the test. And he found out that when they recited the Ten Commandments, none of the atheists or agnostics cheated on the test. There was a control group where they cited their most favorite, the titles of their ten most favorite books, and after that there was widespread cheating throughout the test. 
And so he talks about the importance of zero tolerance. And he says this, if you believe that the rule is sacred, a commandment from God, the unquestionable law of a higher power, then it becomes an especially bright line. This comes from a very famous book he's written called Rediscovering the Greatest Human Strength, the Willpower. Now there are other studies that assist in self-control, bright lines with it Baumeister has studied, Worthy goals are also helpful. This is why it's good to have a sense of purpose and why when people come to our depression recovery program, many of them have lost purpose. If we ask them at the beginning of the time, what are your goals? So many of them will say, I have no goals. But as time goes on, their brains start clearing up. They can start thinking of goals. In fact, sometimes right off the bat, we'll ask them, what did your goals used to be before you, did, you thought you were not going to be able to accomplish them? Because that's how people lose goals, is they've had goals and they're not accomplished, and then they think it's just better not to have them anymore. But developing worthy goals that are high goals but are accomplishable, it helps with self-control. The studies are clear. Enhancing the frontal lobe helps with self-control. This is why music can help. Uh, why uh, studying the book of Daniel can help enhancing the frontal lobe and help with self-control. Slowing down a limbic system in overdrive also helps. This is your lower brain that wants to take over. And when you watch more entertainment television, the limbic system goes into overdrive. When you're, you know, listening to syncopated rock and roll rhythm music, your limbic system is going to rev up into overdrive. Um, when you're viewing pornography, it's a very high limbic system overdrive. And there's other things as well. And so s changing your habits to slow down a limbic system in overdrive will help with self-control. The Old Testament also talked about self-control. Solomon wrote, he that is slow to what? Anger is better than the mighty. And he that does what? Ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Ellen White comments on that text. She says, he has conquered self, the strongest foe man has to meet. The highest evidence of nobility in a Christian is what? Self-control. He who can stand unmoved amid a storm of abuse is one of God's heroes. He who has learned to rule his spirit will rise above the slights, the rebuffs, the annoyances to which we are daily exposed, and these will cease to cast a what? A gloom over his spirit. So you can have all sorts of slights and rebuffs and annoyances, but you're not going to get gloomy. It is God's purpose that the kingly power of sanctified reason, controlled by divine grace, shall bear sway in the lives of human beings. He who rules his spirit is in possession of this power. The man or woman who preserves the balance of the mind when tempted to indulge passion stands higher in the sight of God and heavenly angels than the most renowned general that ever led an army to battle and to victory. Notice how she puts that. The man or woman who preserves the what? The balance of the mind, so in other words, the frontal lobe that is supposed to be the control center of the brain is still the control center. Preserves the balance of the mind when tempted to what? Indulge passion, stands higher in the sight of God and heavenly angels and the most renowned general that ever led an army to battle and to victory. Well, now I'm going to tell you the fail-safe solution to comprehensive self-control. Everything else I've talked about is important. Even what Baumeister has researched and these secular researchers, it's important. But it doesn't get to the core solution. And there is a core solution. What young men and women need is Christian heroism. To rule the spirit means to keep what? Self under what? discipline and now notice this God's abounding love and presence in the heart will give the power of self-control and will mold and fashion the mind and character so where does this come from 
the power of comprehensive self-control does not come from inside of us. The power of comprehensive self-control comes from outside of us. And what is it that produces it? God's abounding love and presence in the heart. She goes on to say, the grace of Christ in the life will direct the aims and purposes and capabilities into channels that will give moral and spiritual power, power which the youth will not have to leave in this world, but which they can carry with them into the future life and retain through the eternal ages. Christ said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have what? Love one to another. Commenting on this in that book, My Life Today, that little devotional, if we would be true lights in the world, we must manifest the loving, what type of spirit of Christ? Compassionate spirit of Christ. To love as Christ loved means that we must what? Practice self-control. It means that we must show unselfishness at all times and in what? All places. So if you've had an issue with self-control, comprehensively in your life. The core reason for it is there is selfishness in corners of your life. And so that's a little bit of a red flag. Where is self rising up? The key to self-control is self-sacrifice. And it's self-sacrificing love. This is a love that human beings don't have naturally. True transformative healing is dependent on love. Love can change you, and it can change the world. Not erotic love, romantic love, or even brotherly love, as good as those loves are. It's a love that human nature totally lacks. The Bible calls it, what? Agape love. And that love comes from where? The love of God. How rich, how pure, how measureless. And so this is what the world is searching for. They know self-control is wonderful. It's great. It's the psychological good life, but they don't know how to take someone from low self-control to high self-control. And this is really the underlying purpose of why Samyuk University was formed. Was to be able to show the world the way that they can experience the psychological good life. Christ said, I came to give life and to give it how? More abundantly. And that abundant life, that psychological good life, actually comes from the agape love that he is willing to bestow. Science calls it altruistic love. My life today goes on. It says it means that we must scatter around us, what? Kind words and pleasant looks. These cost the giver nothing, but they leave behind a precious fragrance. Their influence for good cannot be estimated. Not only to the receiver, but to the giver, they are a blessing. For they react upon him. And now notice this profound phrase. Genuine love is a precious attribute of where? Heavenly origin, which increases in fragrance in proportion as it is what? Dispense to others. So not only can you and I today take hold of this love by being willing to put all on the altar of sacrifice laid, but we can also get more of that love day by day, week by week. How do we get more of that love? By dispensing it to others. We're not going to get that love by holding it into ourselves. We must give that love to others, that self-sacrificing love for the good of others. I will close with two examples in self-control. These two met in Scripture, and they were contrasts in self-control. 
Paul before Nero, how striking the contrast. The countenance of the monarch bearing the shameful record of the passions that raged within. Who is that? Nero. Sometimes you can tell by looking on someone's face there's nothing good going on in that head. And that's the way it was with Nero. You could look at his face and realize there's nothing good going on in there. The countenance of the monarch bearing the shameful record of the passions that raged within. The countenance of the prisoner telling the story of a heart at peace with God and man. Who was that? Paul. The results of opposite systems of education stood that day contrasted. The results of opposite systems of what? Education. So education has a crucial role to play in this. A life of unbounded self-indulgence. Who was that? Nero, and a life of entire self-sacrifice. Who was that? Paul. Here were the representatives of two theories of life. All absorbing selfishness, which counts nothing too valuable to be sacrificed for momentary gratification. For those of you who are here for Sabbath school, I told about the Korean young man. That's where he was at before he came to our program. He counted nothing too valuable to be sacrificed for what? momentary gratification and by the way he's a changed man today he is a very successful man because he caught the solution to this problem notice what else or notice the other theory the other theory is self-denying what endurance ready to give up life itself if need be for what the good of others that was Paul. And then she says, if the soul is to be purified and ennobled and made fit for the heavenly courts, there are two lessons to be learned. What are those lessons? Self-sacrifice and self-control. Everyone that makes it eternally will have had those two keys that they have endorsed. And thus their minds and hearts have been opened to the grace and love of God. And I can tell you, you can just track it for those that come to our program. And you know, the great thing about running programs, and I hope eventually you're going to be running programs like here at Sam Uke University, but the great things is seeing people, yes, they've been abused by the world, yes, they've had problems, yes, they've had trauma, but they come to your program defeated, disheartened, feeling like there's no hope. And in 10 days, they are thoroughly converted. And their hearts and minds are now open and they're receiving that love of God in their heart. And before that, when they came there, they weren't even sure there was a God. Many people with depression and anxiety are pretty godless because they think if God is around, why, is he, why are they in such bad shape? Why is he ignoring them? And so they get to this point of thinking this way, but then once they realize and they come in touch with the solution to this, they grab hold of it. The world is interested in how to get there. So for physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health to be comprehensive and lifelong, it actually demands the true gospel to be complete. And that is what has been lacking in the world. That's why the world is getting worse instead of a better place. Because the world is becoming less about the gospel. Now, this sobering statement. Working in hospital for many years, particularly in the field of gastroenterology, I've seen a lot of deaths due to lack of self-control. And the most despicable things said about human beings that are patients by caregivers often come from the, a person who's an alcoholic cirrhosis patient. They're in with hepatic encephalopathy. We're putting NG tubes down them. We're trying to get rid of the toxins. We tell them to quit drinking. And I can tell you, some of those people, actually, after being introduced to the gospel, have given up alcohol and have lived 
much longer than what anyone predicted the, them to live. But many of them, within a week or two weeks later, they're back in the hospital again and they clearly have been drinking again. They don't have much liver yet left, but they're still drinking alcohol. And the nurses and doctors will say, why are we helping these people? They won't even help themselves. We're spending all these resources, all this time and energy, and they say the most despicable things about them. But Ellen White says the strongest bulwark of vice in our world is not the iniquitous life of the abandoned sinner or the degraded outcast. It's the life that otherwise appears virtuous, honorable, and noble, but in which one sin is fostered, one vice indulged. Why is this the worst? These people will pass to their graves and good things will be said about them at their funeral. They'll be thought of as generally good people. But the difference between good and great is exponential. Had they given up these vices and taken hold of the gospel message in its entirety in their own life, they would have been as transformative as the Apostle Paul. They would have been transformative like Daniel and Joseph. And for everyone that is here today, greatness is at your fingertips. From this day forward, you can be a great individual. Certainly, don't be the strongest of bulwark of vice in our world today. So in closing, I ask you, to make a choice. Choose comprehensive self-control. There's actually no downside. Even the world says there's nothing negative about this. We can't even find anything negative about it. Choose comprehensive self-control. Choose real self-sacrifice. Give yourself to God. What was Paul's solution? How did he turn from a, the person of Romans 7 to the person of Romans 8? I die daily. Daily self-sacrifice, opening up your heart to the abundant grace and love of God in your heart. And that's why Weimar exists. The process of hurting a if healing a hurting world is that people need to hear the truth that goes against their human nature to feel the need of the true gospel to fully incorporate it in their life. This is why we need the health message and we need to have it preached. This is why Ellen White says in the last days, this is the way the gospel will be given to people, is through the healing message. In just about any disease that somebody has, in order for them to have comprehensive healing, they're going to need to change something that goes against their human nature. But they're not going to be able to make that change, even though death is facing them sometimes, unless they come in contact with the love of God in their life. They need the message of health and the message of the gospel to be truly healed. And the beauty of medical missionary work is that they will not just be healed now. They'll be healed for eternity. And that's why Ellen White wrote this. The purpose of health reform. The light God has given on health reform is for what? Our salvation and what else? The salvation of the world. Because when we come across health principles... We can be given a red flag. Are we following these health principles in our life that are best? And if not, self is there. And it's an opportunity to turn from wretchedness to having the love of Christ imbue us and to work through us. And the opportunity to say, no, I am going to put all on the altar of sacrifice laid. And so it actually is there to see as a barometer how we are doing in this quest of comprehensive self-control. I'll close with the words of Paul. Just before he was executed, he wrote a letter passing the baton over to Timothy. 
And he said, God gave us a spirit not of what? Fear, but of power and love. And he uses the term that self-sacrificing agape love. And what else? Self-control. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the secret of comprehensive self-control. You have the solutions that this world is hungering and thirsting for. And now as every head is bowed and every eye closed, there are those here that have recognized in their own life they've had selective self-control but not comprehensive self-control. Had some things in their life that they know would be best for them to do, but they haven't really been doing them consistently, or things that they know are harmful and they've been imbibing in on occasion. And perhaps today they've seen for the first time a better way of putting all on the altar of sacrifice laid and opening up their heart and mind to your grace and abundant love. And they desire to make a commitment today. No more floundering, but I choose comprehensive self-control. And they want to notify you of this by raising their hands to you this day. Lord, you see the hands. You see the commitment that has been made here today. I pray that you will seal that commitment. And that each one that's made this commitment would endorse the words of Paul, I die not only today, but daily. Putting all on the altar of sacrifice laid, following your will in our life, recognizing that your will is far better than our will, and you will indeed imbue us with the abundant psychological good life with no downsides. And so we thank you for your willingness to do this to each one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you so much for attending today. Uh, we're finished for the worship service. So the lunch is not in the Pine House. As your bulletin says, it's right upstairs on the first floor, just one floor up from the uh, entrance here.